Good morning, friends. It's a privilege to be here again this morning. And I, they told me they had a special meeting and it made some minutes and they wanted me to come hear those minutes of what, the, if I had anything to say for or against it about, uh, said there was something about interviews that had some trouble. I think that's a grand like that. I accept that. It gives me a chance then that I can... Uh, there is so many, I guess there's around 600 on waiting list right now, see, of uh, special interviews, and I'm morally obligated to my word to stay with each one until that we hear from God for that person, see. And then if you do that, you might have one fellow out on the waiting list there for, or maybe with that one person waiting for two or three weeks for that one person, see, until we actually hear from God, coming together, praying together, going back, separating, coming back together, praying together, till we have, thus saith the Lord for that person. Well, in that time, see, these other things. Now, this way, the way I understand it right, that each one will write their request, whatever they are, and it's handed in to me and let me have it, and then let me pray over this request, and I can call these people to work. Is that, was that the way it was? Now, that, that's fine. See, and then uh, maybe while I'm waiting with this one person, I could get 100, 200 people right in this one this group right here where I'm waiting on one because that way it'll give me an, a chance then to get to see more people. I, I really like that. Everyone fell on that idea. I think it's pretty good. That's fine. And um, so um, now this has been a kind of a great week for me these last couple of weeks. I, I've been out before our Lord, as you understand. But I think before we start the service, i uh, I think I, at one, I know I got a grandson here somewhere in the building. And perhaps if he's a brand, he's disorderly running around here somewhere. <laughs> Maybe. So he's, a, he's the one that had to take these instructions. Uh, so he's uh, around here somewhere. I think there's a dedication service. And for other mothers who have their little ones, well, if Brother Teddy, I believe it is, will come to the piano. And uh, we're going to sing our familiar old uh, dedication service of babies. Uh, bring them in. Now, <clears throat> many people in many churches, they uh, sprinkle the babies. And uh, we try to follow just the trend of the Bible, just as close as I know how to follow it. Now, there's no place in the Bible where they ever sprinkle an adult, let alone a baby. And uh, nowhere there's ever sprinkling was ever... Uh, ordained of God, a baby or adult. But um, there is in the Bible where they brought little children unto Jesus, and he lifted up his hands and laid them upon the little ones and blessed them and said, Suffer little children to come unto me. Now that's our, our way of doing it here. And now as his servants, we just take them before, before God in prayer. And if there's anyone here that's got your little baby that has not been dedicated, we don't believe in baptizing in any form those little babies because they have no sin. They are born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies, but they have nothing to repentance of, and baptism is unto repentance and remission of sin. Amen. So their baby has nothing to repent for. And when Jesus died on the cross, he cleansed all sin. And now when we get old enough to know that we got to repent for what we did, then we are and recognize that Christ died for us. That little baby can't recognize that, that Christ died for him. But when we are old enough to recognize that Christ died for us, and then we are, we are baptized then unto his death and raised to his resurrection. Lord willing, next Sunday I get on that, the Lord, if God willing. Amen. Now, <clears throat> therefore, we bring them and dedicate them. Any mothers, any church, any creed, any color, anything else, we dedicate all little children to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Brother Teddy, if you let us sing this, bring them in, if you will. All right. Let's all together now. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. The vision I had just after the going of my mother, that's what I was leading the song to bring them in when the little children were bringing. Amen. 
This is uh, William Brand. <laughs> There's three of us standing here together, William Brand. Three generations, three names. You're looking me over this morning. <laughs> There's something about him kind of innocent looking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, he's William Carl Jr. And so we are grateful, I am this morning, to give to the Lord Jesus from the arms of his father, my son, the grandson, for our life of service. Blessings upon the father and mother. Yes. Let us bow our heads. Our gracious heavenly father. I know I'm getting way up the road. I hold my grandson in my hand. But I'm thinking of Jacob when he brought his grandchildren between his knees when he was an old man, Hebrew and Manasseh, blessed those children and imparted to them the spiritual blessings that lasted even to this day. I have crossed his hands from one to the other, taking the blessing from the Jews and the Gentiles and the cross. Let the God of heaven come near now. This grandson that you have given to me, Lord, through my son and my daughter-in-law, I'm thinking of she being barren to raise those children and coming down that day from Yakima, Washington, when she was crying and said, I wish I could have a baby. Your spirit came into the car and there I said, you shall have it. And today I hold this fine little boy in my hand. Your spoken word. Yes. Your promise. Yes. Now, Lord, in simplicity of our actions, we place this baby by faith in the hands of the Lord Jesus. Yes. That him being here in the form of the Holy Spirit will take the baby into his arms and his care. And will guide it through life. Give it health and strength. A long life if you tarry. And may the baby be used to your glory. May the power of the living God rest upon it. If he lives to be a man, and Jesus tarries, may he preach the gospel. Oh, glory. The power of God that gave him to his mother and father. May it never depart from him. Bless his daddy and his mother. May they be raised, this, may raise this baby in the Christian atmosphere that all possible human dreams that they can do, this baby shall have. Now, little Billy Paul Branham Jr., I give thee to Almighty God in dedication. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's something about little babies that I think is so sweet. <clears throat> I remember Lois, she's cried and clutched her hand. She's real nervous. And Lois has come up there out of great tribulation. <clears throat> Just a little Kentucky girl and had rather a hard life. And she, one night Jesus appeared to her standing in the cold. And she come running up to the house around midnight, her and Billy, as they got married. And they... Um, down by the side of the duofold there, I put my arm around her and led her to the Lord Jesus. She wanted babies so bad. They'd been married several years. And coming down from Yakima one day, she was kind of weeping. It had been a... The Holy Spirit came in and told her of female trouble that she'd had, had called reasons she could not have any babies. And then the Holy Spirit came again and 
curse that female trouble and give her the blessing. I dedicated him just now. <clears throat> there was, um, I have some little things wrote out here that I want to say first before we read the text. First is future meetings. I have written. That is next Sunday, the Lord being willing. I know it's getting icy and bad on the roads and we got people here come from Georgia and Alabama and Florida and Ohio and Illinois and, and this little group of people that are made up from everywhere. Some of the people tell me, so I passed by your church down there, Billy, in the mornings there, these license from all over the country here. I say, yep. One here and one there. That's where I think the bride will be. <laughs> Two in the field. I'll take one, leave one, and so forth. And I, I don't want the people to drive them icy roads. And I know it, I too, that right after Christmas now, I'll be leaving in the field, the Lord willing. I've got about 15 different services set up now. And... Um, I want to announce on next Sunday, the Lord willing, I want to teach on a very uh, outstanding message to me. Amen. I've been studying this week and the week before on Bible history, and I want to speak on the subject of Christianity versus paganism, so idolatry, next Sunday. And then the next Sunday is... Uh, Christmas Eve day, next Sunday, and uh, a Sunday a week, I mean, pardon me. Sunday a week is Christmas Eve day. Now, if I give out for a message and those, uh, some of my dear friends come from Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia and around like that, the little children will sure be disappointed on the night of Christmas. And if the Lord puts up on my heart to bring the Christmas message to the church, I will then, if God being willing, I promise everyone that's out of town, see, I'll send you the tape myself. So you won't have to leave your kitties out for Christmas night, Christmas Eve night, and then uh, I'll, I'll send you the tape at my compliment, see, uh, uh, of the meeting. And uh, just remember that. Another thing, you know, you, you can't expect everybody to believe everything you say. <laughs> It just, it just doesn't work that way. I forgot this morning, rushing away quickly, um, on account of getting down here, I happened to look up, Brother Woods brought my wife and them down, I, I looked up and it's almost time to start the service down here for me to come in, and they told me, Billy called me last night and said, they want me here this morning to hear these minutes read from the last meeting. I was going to bring a history just to try to straighten something that I've said. No matter how clear you try to make it, still someone doesn't get it. <clears throat> it's about altars and church. See? Someone says, Brother Brandon, don't believe in an altar and a church. I do believe in an altar and a church. See? But altars was not the place where people come to pray. There never was an altar call made in any time in the Bible. There is no such a thing. And I want to bring you, I will next Sunday, in the history of the early church, that the reason there was no altars in the church because falling prostrate at an altar is a pagan form of worship and is not a Christian uh, idea at all. Now, I will speak on that also next Sunday. But there was no altars in the early church to make altar calls. There was nothing but just a hollow room. That's all. No crucifix, no nothing. There was nothing in the room but just a flat floor. The people were, the, the Pentecostal church in the early days, as I will bring you from many different historians next Sunday, Lord willing, and I want to bring it to you from... Ironside's early pilgrim church and from Hossus to Babylon, from pre-Nicene fathers, the Nicene council, oh, so many of them. Hazelton's writings of the early church 
and different ones, you see, to show you that nowhere, even in Ireland, where I have visited in the church that the Catholics call a Catholic saint, St. Patrick, but was absolutely not one speck of history nowhere that says that at St. Patrick was nothing but a protester of the Roman Church. There's nowhere no one can produce any history that'll show that that he was a Catholic. He his all of his schools is in Northern Ireland. Then when this Catholic uh, emperor come in in England, he put to death ten thousand of St. Patrick's people. And the churches still stand there today. His schools all in Northern England. And where you hear it say St. Patrick run all the snakes out of Ireland, you know what it was? The historical facts of it. He believed in Pentecost that had power to pick up serpents, take up serpents. And that's where he said, God started. And Peter being crucified head down in Rome, there's not in the martyrology. And I've searched every one everywhere and read of historians, everything I know of. And there's not one scripture that said either Paul or Peter was ever killed in Rome. It's dogmas. It's just been started by the first Roman church, and it's not truth. There's a whole lot. I'll get in that next Sunday. Then another thing I have so much to hear about. Someone <laughs> told me a great outstanding preacher. He said, Brother Brown, won't you leave them women alone? <laughs> he said, you know, people regard you as a prophet. Why don't you teach them high spiritual things? That man may be sitting present. If it is, I want you to get this, brother. Won't you teach them high spiritual things where you climb and let them climb there instead of telling them about not cutting their hair and the kind of dresses to wear? If you're here or hear the tape, brother, if I can't get them out of kindergarten, how am I going to teach them algebra? Amen. <laughs> they haven't got the decency and morality about them to even let their hair grow out and wear dress like ladies. How you go teach them spiritual things? Amen. I don't know the first. Don't know ABCs and try to teach them um, something high. Give them a college education when they don't know ABC. <laughs> Let learn ABCs first, and then we'll, we'll go on to that. <clears throat> now, last week you had a, a great man here at the pulpit uh, to take my place. That was uh, Brother William Booth Cleburne, which is known amongst all the preachers to be the prince of the preachers. Great man, great great preacher. Frankly, he's one of the best there is in the lands anywhere. The man can preach the gospel in seven different languages. So you can imagine what he is. And he's a full gospel preacher. He was the one that stayed with me in that debate with them seven Church of Christ preachers that time. And if there ever was a people I felt sorry for, it was that man after he got through with them. <laughs> I never heard such in my life. They even got up and started walking away. He met him at the door and said, I thought you wanted to talk about divine healing. And he's so flat, oh, just so awful flat. He just called him everything he could, ignoramuses and everything, you know. So he, he's real flat. And uh, that's the only thing about it. If he just seasoned that knowledge with some love, it would be different, you see. And uh, he, uh, he may be here. <laughs> but I, I mean that, you know, like that. If he'd just be real sweet about it. But, oh, my, he's an Englishman and he just... Really can get so stirred up. But he met him at the door and pointed his finger in his face and said, you ever jump on him again as me? He said, I'll expose you before the public and I really may make a bunch of donkeys out of you. He said, I've never heard of him since. See? I don't blame him. I'd stay away also. Yes, because you'll never get a word in edgeways around Brother Booth. Wonderful preacher. Fine man. Good, Christian, clean, moral man. As far as I know anything about him and know him for years. I got to hear his tape, what he preached on you about how holy and high God was. And how we were born in sin and what could a man ever do that would bring, could tell God what to do. See, And that really was wonderful. Now the reason I was gone at this time, I'd had a week of fasting and prayer which had led me to have a decision. And I got a little switch here, supposed to be somewhere, a sensor, sensor, what I didn't want. Oh, here we are. This is it. 
uh, what I want on tape and what you don't want on tape. <laughs> so, brethren, if your tape's a little messed up, well, don't, you can cut that part out. Now, in there, that way so many taken when uh, Brother Mercener and them had the only ones who could take tapes, so I, uh, I'd have them to censor them out there before I let them go out. But uh, in this, anybody can take them now. You see, anybody that wants to take them can take them. And so I, I have to censor myself from the switch right here, what I don't want to say, or let go out over the tapes. Because there's some things I could tell you all here that I certainly wouldn't want to get out with the people, because let them alone. <laughs> the blind leads the blind, they all fall in the ditch anyhow, you see. So just don't offend them. Like Jesus said, don't offend them Pharisees. He said, if they, want some, if they want some tribute money, go down and cast a hook in the sea and get the first fish and take the coin out of his mouth and go pay him. So don't, don't offend him. Just let him alone. But in all my life, since I've been a little boy, I've, the Lord has always given me visions, which we are acquainted with here at the church. And I'm sure in the land where these tapes will travel also. Of visions. And with this open Bible before me, and before God who I stand, I have never known of one of them failing. They've always been perfect. And I had a vision a few weeks ago, about three weeks now, this coming Tuesday, that drove me to my knees and out into the wilderness to fast and pray. And uh, I put on... Being this cold, heavy, insulated, uh, underclothes, so that I to use on hunting trips, so I wouldn't freeze up around there in my cave and in the woods. And I went up. Not someone said, "Well, brother Bram, did you go up to seek? You ought to went up to seek a vision from the Lord." I said, "No, you don't go. You don't do it that way. You can't pull nothing out of God." See, that's the reason people keep standing on the interview saying. Ask the Lord, just stay with it, just stay with it. I had a word of the Lord take to Brother Neville about prophesying over everyone comes by this altar here. God told him, really called him down about it. See, yeah. don't do that. You'll shove him out in the flesh and then you'll have a false prophet. See, yeah, see? let him do just as the Spirit leads him to do. See, don't, don't try to pull nothing out of God because you can't do it. Yeah. He'll only speak like Balaam, the hireling prophet said, uh, I can only speak what God puts in my mouth. Otherwise, Amen. I can't say it. Amen. And that's the same thing I like this system they got now so that I can find out what, just what the Lord would have do. It's very good. But Jesus went to the wilderness to fast after the Holy Ghost had come upon him. John bare records seeing the Spirit of God had come up on him and he was filled with the power of God, God in him. And then he went into the wilderness to fast afterwards, not before for the Holy Ghost to come on him, but he went in and fasted after the Holy Ghost came on him, see. And now, in the vision, I might say this, I mentioned it once. I was going to cut it off the tape, but I believe I'll just leave it on. <clears throat> I is about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, I suppose. I'd gotten up. And I looked were in front of me and I was coming down to the Jordan. Looked like I was standing on the map of Palestine. And I was coming down to the Jordan. And it seemed like I could hear this song. I'm going down to the Jordan. Someone was saying it. And as I drew near the river, I looked back and seen which way I had come, and I was two-thirds of the way there to the Jordan. And uh, I looked across Jordan, and I said, Oh, praise God, just on the other side is where all the promises lay. Every promise lays in the promised land. And then I came to myself. I thought, could I possibly have, could it have been that I was dreaming? Uh, because it's nighttime. See, a vision is something that you see with your eyes open just like a dream. You're looking right at it. And you're, you're conscious that you're standing like you're on the platform and you're, you're standing here, but yet 
you look like you're in a dr dream. It's, you can't explain it. There's no way to do it. See? It's God's works, and God's ways are unexplainable. Amen. They have to be accepted by faith. Amen. Then as I uh, sit there a little bit, the side of this chair, then all of a sudden, here it come back again. Then I knew then that it was vision. And then when I come into the vision again, it seemed that I was lifted up and setting on a, a highway, a narrow highway with some brother. I never knew who the brother was. I looked around and I said, Now I am sure and know this is vision. The Lord God is here. And it seemed like everybody was afraid. I said, What's everybody so afraid of? And a voice came and said, There's such danger in these days. There's a great hideous thing that's death when it strikes you. And I heard the weeds a mashing down and I looked and here come a huge monster snake crawling through the weeds. And I thought, now knowing this is vision, then I shall see what this, uh, this animal or this beast is. And he crawled up on the highway and as soon as I got sight of him, I knew it was a mumba. Now a mumba is an African snake, which is the most deadly bite of all things there is. There's nothing as poison as a mumba. And the snake, of course, represents sin, death. See? And uh, there is the, the, we have in this country the rattlesnake and the copperhead and the cottonmouth moccasin, many of those snakes that if you're in bad health and want to bite you, it would perhaps kill you. But if you didn't get aid of some sort, right away. And then, uh, then we go into Africa and India and we find the cobra. There's a black cobra. He's a bad snake. He's a death by two. And there's the yellow cobra, which is far beyond him. And the yellow cobra, uh, the patient dies with such a horrible death, it dies from suffocation. It, it paralyzes the breathing system. And they, they can't breathe and just open their mouth and gap and try to and die like that. And that was the type of snake with just one lick from getting Billy Paul when we got the snake in Africa. And there and then comes the mumba. He's dead. Just when he, he's so fast you can't see him. He goes over the top of the weeds and propels himself with the back of his tail. Just, and he's gone. Hits you in the face usually. Stands up high and strikes hard. And when he hits you, you've just got a few breaths till you're finished. Turn real. It don't only paralyze the get in the bloodstream, it gets nerves, everything. You're just die just in a few seconds. Them native boys and track boys, you can say mumba and they'll butt their heads together and scream because it, it's death just in a few seconds. See, when one hits you. And here he was on the highway. I thought, well, this is it. So I looked at him and he looked angry at me. And he licked his tongue, and here he come. But when he got right close to me, he'd run up fast, and then he'd get slower and slower, and just quiver and stop, and then something would hold him off. He couldn't bite me. And he'd turn around on the other side and try to approach from this side. And he'd get back and get a start, and he'd whisk right towards me, get slower and slower and slower, and then to a stop, and then just shake like that and move back. He couldn't strike me. Then he turned and looked at my friend, and away he went after my friend. And I see my friend just jumping way in the air over him and over him and over him trying and a thing was striking at him. I thought, oh, if it ever hits him, it'll be instant death. No wonder everybody's so scared because when this thing hits you, it's an instant death. And, and it was just striking at him like that. I threw my hands up. I said, oh, God, have mercy on my brother. I said, if that serpent ever strikes him, it'll kill him. And just then the serpent turned to me when I said that. And looked at me again. And a voice came from above me and said, You have been given power to bind him, the worst or any. And I said, Well, God, what must I do? He said, There's one thing you must do. You must be more sincere. Okay? You must be more sincere. I said, Well, God... Forgive me for my unsincerity and let me have sincerity. And when I raised up my hands to him again, there was a great something came over me. Just lifted me up. It seemed like it, my whole body was charged with something. And I, 
I looked at the serpent, and then he started towards me, and he couldn't do it yet. And I said, Satan, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind you. And the serpent, a blue smoke flew out of him, and he curled up and made that sign like a S, capital S, made backwards, an and sign. And means bind this one or anything below him, because he was the worst. Blue smoke fell out of him, and his tail choked his own self to death around his head when he made this backwards S, that and sign, like a conjunction, you see. Choked it to death. And the brother was free. And I went over and mashed on it. I said, now, I've got to find out about this because it's vision. And I hit on the, on the thing, and it turned like that. It looked like a handle on a glass handle on a pitcher. It just made it solid crystal. And I said, think of that. How quick that blue smoke was life and everything it left it. All the elements, and it's turned to glass. And just then, a voice came again and said, you can unbind him also. So I said, then, Satan... That I might know, I unbind you. And when he did, he started coming to life again, wiggling. And I said, I bind you back in the name of Jesus Christ. And when he did, the smoke flew out of him again. And he choked himself right back again and turned to crystal. And then when he did that, that voice said, Now you must be more sincere than what you are to do this. Oh, and then it left me and I was standing in the room. Hallelujah. A few moments I heard the clock go off and my wife had got getting up. The children, you know how it is. I guess it's your house. One, what am I going to wear today, Mama? Where are my books and what did I do? You know, you just like any home, you can't you hear yourself think hardly for all of them trying to get ready at once. And, and so I slipped off into the den room and I got out on my knees and I said, Lord Jesus, I don't know these things. And what must I do? And the children be calling me, take them to school in a few moments. What must I do? And I looked around and my Bible was laying there. And I said, Lord, if you will forgive me, I do not believe in just opening up the Scripture and taking something out of the Bible and saying that. But there is times that when God can comfort you by such a thing. And I said, Lord, in this case of emergency right now, before your spirit leaves me, and I, I don't know what to do. The kids will be an hour yet before they be gone. Would you just show me if that was something you're trying to get to me, Heavenly Father? Then let me know. And I took this Bible and just pulled it open like that. And my thumb was laying at 1 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, the 8th verse. When something reads something like this. When you come, I was planning on taking a fast to the Lord. I told him I'd go out and fast. So when you come to this feast, which a fast in the body is a feast with the Lord. We know that. So when you come to this feast, don't come with the old eleven or the leaven of malice and so forth, but come with the, the unleavened bread of sincerity. Oh. And truth, just exactly what he had told me in the vision. Come, God is my solemn judge. Come with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That is the word. Then I seen what he meant as he, years ago when I seen the Bible come down, I got it wrote right here, come down and a hand came from heaven and pointed down to Joshua and read the first nine verses and stopped there. That's Joshua Come to the wilderness, but never did he was ready. To, when he got near Jordan, God called him out. Amen. Said, this day I'll begin to magnify you before the people. And then he took the children of Israel across Jordan to the land where give them, divided to them, the promised land. Amen. I went to the woods and prayed and prayed and fasted. And now... I went back to that tree where I met where those squirrels was that you've heard in other messages, see, where those squirrels was. And standing there along about three or four o'clock in the morning, after I'd staggered through the brush with what light I could see to get to the tree, coming early because I was led there. And then I met him. God help me to ever live true. I'm going to read my text now.
I have taken for a text this morning, roll down here somewhere, oh, here it is, Joshua, in the book of Joshua, the 10th chapter, to you who are going to read behind me, or the 10th chapter and the 12th verse, and I just have one hour, and then uh, I think... I'm not sure, but I believe Billy said he'd give out prayer cards this morning. So there wasn't very many, but just some people want to be prayed for. And uh, if anybody got prayer cards, raise up your hand. I thought, oh, that's right. Okay, that's fine. All right. Now, the 12th verse of the 10th chapter of Joshua. And now, remember now, in the future, next Sunday, I want to speak on Christianity versus idolatry, and then I'll tell you from then about whether the Lord leads on for the Christmas message or not. It seems like that I have a message on my heart for the people at Christmas, and then I'll tell you from then. Now beginning the reading at the 12th verse of the 10th chapter of Joshua. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said... In the sight of Israel, Son, stand I still upon Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people avenged themselves upon their enemy. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven. And hasten not to go down about a whole day. Listen now. And there was no day like that before or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. And Joshua returned and all Israel with him unto the camp at Gilgal. May God add His blessings to His Hallelujah. Word. Amen. Now, I wish, if it be the will of the Lord, that you tarry with me for a few minutes. I want to take a subject, strange, odd, upon reading such a scripture. And I want your attention and and prayer during this time. I want to take the subject of one word, paradox. And first I'd like to explain maybe what a paradox is. In the Webster's Dictionary, it says that a paradox means something that's incredible but true. That is a paradox. Something that's almost completely out of reason couldn't be so, but yet it is. That's a paradox. Now I want to rest a few minutes on these words. A paradox. Now we have many things that we could refer to as paradox. One thing that I would like to refer to is this world itself is a paradox. Its standing is a paradox. Last night I was talking to my daughter, Rebecca, that's in high school. And I was studying here in the Scripture and, and was telling her about reading this, uh, this verse here. And she said, Daddy, Joshua actually stopped the world, didn't he? I said, I don't know what he stopped. He stopped the sun. She said, he could not stop the sun because the sun doesn't travel. I said, the reflection of it travels across the earth, though. And he stopped that. She said, well, then God stopped the world. I said, then to the agnostic, what happens if the world happens to stop and lose its gravitation? It would shoot through space like a... A star and missiles of it be falling for a hundred billions of years in space. 
But the Bible said that the sun stopped and held its place for a whole day. I believe it. I believe it. It's unreasonable and incredible, but it's the truth. Pray tell me then, which is the top side of the world, the North Pole or the South Pole? How do you know if you're in space? You say the South Pole's down under us. They think the North Pole's down under them. It's standing in a space. And a little circle of air as it's turning some thousand something miles per hour causes 24 or 25,000 miles around it. And it turns around 24 hours so it make it going better than a thousand miles an hour. Uh, traveling around and it never misses striking exactly where it's, where it's on the equator where it goes around. It never misses a minute. Perfectly timed standing in the air. If that isn't a paradox, I don't know what one is. How that it's all the heavenly systems, how they are so timed so perfectly till that in years that's to come, 20 and 30 years from now, science can see the coming of the eclipse of the sun and the moon passing and can tell you to the moment when they will pass and when the eclipse will start. No matter how fine a watch that we have, one of the precision, I've got one here that was given to me in Switzerland as a present when I was there. The value is about $300 in American money that was given to me. There isn't a week but what it has to be retimed. All clocks, nothing that man can make is so perfect. It'll, in a few years, it'll be worn out and gone. As it gets older, it'll get worse all the time. The jewels will wear down. The accuracy of it will leave it. There's nothing that can be ground or fixed out by man or honed out by man that can stay perfect, but this world stays perfect. What controls it? Well, you say, I don't know. What controls it? What holds it in its place? It truly is a paradox. It's, you cannot describe how God does it, but He does it. Amen. So that's the main thing, and He does it. And we know that it's so. Amen. It's incredible how that you could spin a ball in the air. It will not make one complete revolution in the same place. I was thinking here some time ago when I was in the desert. And uh, one of these little jumping cactuses that the acids in your blood will draw right to you. One of those fellows jumped on to me. And uh, you can't pick it off. You have to take something and rake it off. And it's got little burrs on it. And no matter how well you sharpen a needle, a needle will be blunt on the end. The perfect sharpness of a needle will be as perfect as you could get it. It'll be blunt to one of those jumping cactuses. And yet it is a leaf itself rolled down tight. How could it be that nature could roll a leaf tighter and sharper on the point than a fine machine could grind one? And yet, plumb down to the end of that point is little fish hook burrs, like that little burrs to keep it, to hold itself in as it goes. Oh, a paradox, right? To science. It's incredible, but it's true. I would like for someone to explain this. I could not tell you exactly the miles or how many miles science says that the moon is from the earth. But how could that moon, I would say standing millions and millions of miles away from the earth and yet controls that tide of the sea? What does it? How can it be done? It's a paradox. But yet we look and see that it's done. It happens. The moon controls the tides. When the moon rocks out like this on the earth, the tide goes with it. And God has put the moon over the tides and set the boundaries, and they cannot pass that boundary.
where God drawed a line and said, See, you can come this close, but you cannot take the rest of it. For I'm putting a guard over you. That moon, millions of miles from the earth, calls to that sea and it sets its boundaries and controls it. Incredible. What is on that moon? When just a few miles off the earth, all gravitation, all air, everything else leaves. Goes out into space where there's not even air for millions and millions and multiplied millions of miles. And yet, <coughs> it controls it. It says you can go so far, but you can't go no farther. For I'm the guard of God. I'm the watchdog. That's set here and you cannot pass these boundaries. Explain that. That's a paradox. How that God does that, but yet He does it. It cannot be explained. We got winter time. Snow on the ground. Cold. Ground's freezing. A little seed. And in that little seed is a germ of life. And that little seed will freeze and burst open in the pump will run out of it and that germ of life will be laying in the dust in a frozen sheet of ice that would kill any life how is it preserved and then comes again in the springtime couldn't explain that could we it's a paradox Amen. we take Hebrews 11 chapter and the third verse we understand there that the Bible says, Paul speaking, that the world was framed and put together by the Word of God. A paradox that a, a Word could speak and out of that Word would, would form material things. Amen. So that things that do appear was made out of things that does not appear. Things that we see was a spoken word of God. The earth is the word of God. The trees are a word of God. Why would we be afraid to trust one that's given such a word with such power and authority? Amen. Why would we be afraid to take that word to ourselves and apply it to our, our own self? Shows where we have fallen in unbelief. It's a word, God's word, a paradox. Truly a paradox. God's word. Also, I would like to show a paradox right quick. And that's when God called Abraham and told him when he was a hundred years old and Sarah was ninety. Forty years uh, past the time of menopause for her. And Abraham, whose life was as good as dead. And Sarah, who was barren to begin with. And her womb as good as dead. And yet, God said that he would bring to them a child. Amen. That's a paradox. Ask the doctor if a woman a hundred years old could raise a baby, have a baby. It's impossible. It's incredible. But she did it. Amen. Because God said she would do it. Amen. It's an incredible thing to think that a man could sit with his back turned to a tent, a stranger, with dust on his clothes, and tell a woman who is the back of the tent what she was thinking about. A paradox. Incredible, but yet it's true. Amen. It was incredible when Abraham, taking Isaac to the top of the mountain, his only begotten son, and took him up to the top of the mountain to offer him up as a sacrifice. And when he got to the top of the mountain and laid Isaac on the wood and was ready to take his life, and when he's coming down with his hand, 
something caught his hand, and there was a ram hooked by its horns in the wilderness on top of the mountain. A paradox. Where'd the ram come from? How could it be a hundred miles from civilization without being killed with lions and, and jackals and wild dogs and beasts and things? Where did it come from? How did it get there? And up on top of the mountain where there's no water. Why was it there when he picked up the rocks? He called the name Jehovah Jireh. The Lord's provided himself a sacrifice. Incredible. But yet it's so true. Amen. For he is Jehovah Jireh. Incredible things to our knowledge and science. But yet it is true. A great paradox. It was a paradox and will be. When Jesus, Mark 11, 22 or 23, when he said, if you say to this mountain, be moved and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you have said will come to pass, you can have what you've said. It's incredible, but it's true. It's a paradox. May I stop here to say, yonder in that woods, sitting with the side of that tree that morning, no squirrels in the woods. But when a voice spoke and said, Say where they'll be. And there, so help me if I die before I finish this message, pointing my finger to a bare, limbed walnut tree, said he'll sit right there. And there he was. Incredible, but true. He said, where will the next one be? I said, over in that bunch of clumps of stuff. And I never took my finger down until there he was. Amen. Hallelujah. Where will the next one be? Out on that snag, out over that feeling. There he was. Amen. It's incredible. Yes. I asked my wife the other morning. I said, honey, have I lost my senses? Am I becoming a madman? What's the matter with me? Why do I say the things I do? What do I do the things I do for? What makes me I love people and yet just rip them apart? And I fast and pray to get rid of it and more I fast and pray the worse it comes. Incredible. But it's true. Amen. It's true. I seen a woman raise her hand just stand back in the building. Praising the Lord was Hattie Wright. Sitting down there when she had two boys of they'll excuse me in saying this, renegades. Boys of the world. That little woman sitting there that day, a widow. And I said, Hattie, the Lord God, you said the right thing. He provided those squirrels. He's Jehovah Jireh. She said, that's nothing but the truth of God. Oh, she said the right thing. It seems incredible that a human being could speak a word as Brother Booth told you, as dirty and filthy as we are. Yeah. Who is he that sets back yonder beyond the moon and stars and uh, all space and time and eternity? As even Booth said it, and I read the same thing the other day, reading Irenaeus, that even the angels are dirty in his sight. Who are we? But a woman said the right thing that called the heart of Jehovah. Said, ask her what she wants and then give it to her. Oh, Amen. Glory. Incredible. But true. Amen. Right here now in our sight is visible evidence. Amen. She asked for her boys, souls to be Christians. God gave her her desire. Amen. Incredible. Hallelujah. That was more of a miracle than healing a sick person. Yes. Amen. That's changed a man's life, his soul, body. And all he is is changed his makeup. Incredible. But true. It was a paradox. We see it everywhere. Paradox in Noah's time. When Noah, 
a man, just an ordinary man. He became a prophet or was a prophet of the Lord, perhaps farming. God told him, prepare for rain to come from heaven. When there was no rain, there'd never been no rain. There's no way to get rain up there. It had never rained on the earth. There was no seas. There was no waters. But yet God told him to make an ark for the saving of his house. And God brought the rain down. It was a paradox. Unscientific. But what? It was a paradox. Anyhow. Yes, it was a paradox. When the Hebrew children that had decided they'd stay with God's word regardless of what happened, that the king built the furnace seven times hotter than it ever had been hit and throw those men in there when the intense heat of the, of the furnace killed the man who walked up the gangplank with them to the mouth of the furnace. They died. But yet those men walked in that furnace for perhaps three hours. Hallelujah. There would be no more even dust of them. For the human life that was in them would have perished. If it made one human life perish by coming close to it, what would it do another human life? But they throw them in there. Amen. And let's say three hours, it might have been five. He might have went and had lunch and come back. Said, open up the furnace door. There won't even be dust of them fellows left. But when he opened the door, there they were. Hallelujah. Unharmed. Walking around in the fire. Incredible. But true. Why? He said, how many did you put in? They said, we have put three in. He said, I see four. That's what made the paradox. <laughs> and that one looks like the son of the gods. He wasn't the son of the gods. He was the son of God. They were heathens. Oh, God in His great word. There come a time when God's army had got cowardly and was afraid of a man and had stood on the side of a hill when they let one man that was three times any their size stand out on the side of the hill and say, Now you trust in a real God, you say. Uh, why don't you fellas come out and fight me? And we won't, we won't have any bloodshed. The enemy of God had backed the church of God Amen. against the hillside and they were taking it. Amen. They were afraid. They were cowards. And in the camp come a little bitty fellow. Little sheepskin wrapped around him, a shepherd's coat. The smallest man in the whole army. And not even a soldier. But it was a paradox. When God took that one man, that one little unconcerned fellow, the Bible said he was ruddy. That one little man put the whole army, the enemy, to fight. That was a paradox. Looks like God would give that great marching army enough courage to go fight. They were servants of God. Why not go fight the battle of God? That's God's enemy. Take it. Looks like he would give them courage, but God took one little individual. And remember, another paradox. He never took a sword. Saul tried to put his armor on him, tried to put a sword in his hand. The poor little fellow couldn't hold it up. And he took a slingshot. A little rubber, a little leather with two pieces of string wrapped on it. And he defeated the whole army of the enemy and put them to rot. It was a paradox how that one little boy Bless the Lord. could put an army to rot. It's a paradox. Sure, God does it. He's just full of it. Sure he is. That's what he does. That's his way of doing it. 
Yes, sir. It was a paradox. When Egypt had a great army that they had, the whole world was conquered. They had every nation under their hands. And when God decided to destroy that army, destroy that nation, looked like he would have raised up some Amorite army or some uh, great army somewhere and would have sent them down there with better equipment or put a consolidation of all the denominations together to go down and to fight together. So he'd get full cooperation. But God used the paradox. He took an old man, 80 years old, and never put a sword in his hand, but a no crooked stick that sunk Egypt in the bottom of the Dead Sea. Incredible. What God can do. But that's why he does it. He uses paradox to do it. See, he brings it to a paradox. A crooked stick of a shepherd instead of a marching army to defeat a, a nation that ruled the world. Oh, the only thing God's waiting on now, I believe. Russia don't mean nothing to God. Amen. He wants to get one man. You don't have to have big organizations. You don't have to have big denominations. He wants to get one man that he can wrap his spirit into him. That'll tell the rest of it. There will be another paradox. They'll tell he can get someone completely surrendered. That will do that. That's the way God does his work. He uses paradox. It was a paradox. When a great soldier of the of God, by the name of Jehoshaphat, stood in the gates with a backslidden man by the name of Ahab, and said, "Before we go to this battle, is not it a good thing that we consult the Lord?" Now, if that man's heart is hungry to know the will of God, there's got to be a will of God somewhere. Not always in the multitude of counsel and safety. Ahab says, I've got all my ministers. They're all prophets. I'll call them up here. And you know, if I bring out 400 prophets, we'll find the word of the Lord. Not always you do. Not always. If it's not with the word, then stay away from it. Don't care how many's there. Stay with that word. God can't take that word back. Now, he brought them all out there and they all prophesied with one accord that the Lord was with them go up. But yet, there was something wasn't right. And that man of God knew that wasn't right. He said, haven't you got one more? Just another one somewhere. Or said, we got one, but I hate him. So said, don't let the king say so. God chose one illiterate boy, a little renegade to the nation, a despised and rejected one, to bring his message to the hungry-hearted. Instead of all the denominations together, speaking with one accord in union, God brought one person. A paradox. But the man had the truth. And it proved to be the truth. Because he's with the word. It was a paradox, exactly. Now you say, you mean you disagree with all this and that and that? If it's not with the word, I disagree with it. Amen. That's right. God's word will never fail. Amen. Talking with a priest not long ago, he said, Mr. Bram, you're trying to argue a point from a Bible. He said, we believe the church. Nothing with that. We believe the church. What the church said. God is in his church. I said, God is in his word and he is the word. Amen. That's right. The Word! That's the reason Micah took the Word and God used the paradox to put every denomination to shame. And brought to pass the Word of the servant of God. 
one man, despised, rejected, hated. Well, hated by his own people. Now, he wasn't a communist or he wasn't something else. Let's say he was Pentecostal. And the Pentecostal groups hated him. They didn't like him. They had nothing to do with him. But he had the Word of God. Amen. God made a paradox out of it. Why wouldn't he, if all these other fellows are prophets and ministers and so forth, why can't in all this whole big group decide something better than one person? Yes. Seem unreasonable that God would just make one man's word right and the rest of them because that man's word was God's word. Amen. That's the reason God brought the thing to pass because a man was with God's word. Amen. The others were prophesying a lie. Yes, it was a paradox when God took one little fellow's word and made it true because it was his word. God has to stand by his word. Amen. Not the council's word, but God's word. Amen. That's who he stands by. He took Micah instead of a well-trained school oh, of ministers. Renowned man. Nothing against them. They were great men. They were men who believed in another God. They believed in the same God Micah believed in. But they act like they believed in it but wouldn't take his word. Because they wanted to be popular. They wanted to find favor with the king. And their blindness overlooked the true word of God. How could God bless what he had cursed? You ladies and men both, don't think that I do this to be nasty. I do it to be honest. Amen. That's the reason. How can I say that women should have, all right, let them cut their hairs off and things like that. Wear their clothes. That ain't got nothing to do with it. God's Word says it does. Amen. She's shameful and disgraceful as long as she does it. And God Amen. will never deal with her. Amen. I don't care how much she speaks in tongues or jumps or shouts. She's not got anywhere with God yet. Amen. That's the word of the Lord. Amen. Man, you can't rule your own house. Amen. And then try to be preachers and deacons. How are you fit to be a preacher in a pulpit? Amen. Amen. To lead the church of the living God and divide for them their inheritance. When you think more of your meal ticket... And the offering, it comes in, then you do the word of God and ashamed to say it before the women, afraid you won't be popular. Amen. God have mercy on your sinful soul. Amen. Amen. Speak the word of God in yes. truth. Yes. John said the axe is laid at the root of the tree and the axe is the word of God. Amen. Amen. Every tree that don't bring forth the right fruit, hew it down and cast yes. it into the fire. Amen. God, bring us another paradox. Why did God take John the Baptist, as I was just speaking of, instead of his well-trained priest of that day? He took a man that never went to school a day in his life. So we understand that John went into wilderness at the age of nine years old and was alone with God. A few days ago in reading of the Nicene Council, that's... Long time after the death of the last apostle, St. John. When those men come up there to that Nicaea council, some of those old brothers embarrass the rest of them. They come there dressed in sheepskins upon those robed emperors like Constantine and the bishops of Rome. Oh, sheepskins wrapped around them and lived in the wilderness on herbs. But they were prophets of the Lord. Oh. The little church, the Greek side went on. The Roman side went back. But it goes to show when you compromise, you can't be a servant of Christ. John, in that day the church was very orthodoxy. They had the priest, a well-trained man. But God chose a man that had no education at all. 
and took him out of the wilderness with a piece of sheepskin wrapped around him and his whiskers all burred out, his hair hanging over his neck, no pulpit to preach from, no church to invite him, but he probably stood in mud half to his knees and preached the kingdom of God at hand. God chose that man. When Jesus said, who did you go out to see? A man that can speak at all the schools? A man that's finally uh, robed and so forth? He said, there are king's palaces. So said, what did you go to see? A prophet? He said, more than a prophet. This is who the prophet spoke of. But come, I send my messenger before my face. He was a, the angel of the covenant. He was the... The great forerunner. But it was a paradox. How God, why didn't he come down to that big school up at Jerusalem? Why didn't he come to Caiaphas as the high priest? Why did he not come to some of those great trained men who had been trained from childhood and their fathers had been trained before them and their fathers before them for generation after generation after generation? Trained and schooled. Fine, high cultured. Educated. And then pick a no man out in the wilderness that never had a day's schooling in his life. And set him out there on the yard and said, this, this is him. A paradox, exactly. Uncredible. But yet it was true. God did. The virgin birth of our Lord. Incredible. For a woman to bring a child without knowing a man. God did it. Amen. God did it. See, it's a paradox. Tuck a little old woman down there, a little old girl engaged to some man about 45 years old. She herself was about 16 or 18 and engaged to this man who was a widower of four children. And then tuck this woman and overshadowed her by the Holy Spirit and conceived in her womb the body that tabernacle of Almighty God. A paradox. How did heaven can't hold him? Earth is his footstool. Heaven's is his throne. And yet can bring the fullness of that Godhead bodily and embodied into a man. When you can measure for hundreds of Billions of miles into aeons of time and never measure God. And yet, a little baby laying in a manger contained the fullness of his body. His body. Jehovah. A paradox. That great God who sets back under to control a hundred million suns shining on planets. Who never began or never ended. And would embody himself in a manured stable. And then we get out and dance and drink and carry on in a celebration. It's not a celebration, it's a worship. Amen. We celebrate Christmas. How that God did that in order he could die. To take the place of a sinner. It was a paradox. When a little curly headed boy. Little stoop-shouldered fella. He probably wasn't five foot tall. And he had seven locks hanging down around his head, a little sissy. And he was uh, uh, on his road down one day to see his girlfriend. And a lion roared against him. Did anybody ever hear a real lion roar? Uh, You probably have in these cages and things around here. But I won't tell you, they're just meowing then. You ought to hear a wild one really roar. The rocks will fall off the hill a half a mile away. Pebbles roll down the hill. It just vibrates the ground. Show where that roar comes from, I don't know. Oh, I seen one one day. He's hanging his head down. Uh, a big old yellow mane lion roared at a black one because a black mane because he picked up a piece of meat. He left it laying there and as if he must say, "Now you leave that alone. I'm going down to get a drink of water." And he went down to lap the water. And when he come back, this black mane had been licking on it. The old pappy just stopped. Put his head down and he let out a belch and I say that the rocks rolled off the hill. Oh my. He'd shake the city if he roared like that. Here. A roar. 
of the line. Oh, he's the ocean. And that roar ran against this little curly-headed shrimp, we called him. And something happened. That little shrimp walks over and gets him by the mouth and puts one hand down this way and one that way, not nervously, and just pulls him apart and lays him down there. <laughs> That's a paradox. <laughs> what caused it? If you'll notice the reading just before it and the conjunction, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Amen. That's what made the difference. Yes. Amen. And he slew the lion. Then one day some Philistines came after him. He was unarmed. There was a thousand of them. They had long spears and big shields. and uh, That's like a door in front of you, like that, shields. Just think of a great big brass shield now all the way in front of you with helmets of brass on, big coats of brass, and all over their shins and everything with brass. Great big long spears long as them. Out to that pole there, maybe uh, 15, 20 feet long. Big brass heads on them like that, sharp as a razor. And they found this little curly-headed shrimp coming down from Palestine to visit some girlfriend of his down there. So they said, there's that little feller. Let's go take him. One man could have tucked him by the end of that spear and just lifted him up and shook him a little bit and he fell right down to his hand, down to the hilt on the spear. Well, he's just a little bitty old guy. Some people, the artist, trying to draw Samson with, with uh, shoulders he couldn't walk in this tabernacle. Well, that wouldn't be no mystery that he, a uh, man that size, Samson was just a little bitty old thing. Amen. But the Spirit of the Lord's what was big. Amen. 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 He takes a... It, it, it's dishonoring the Scripture to say he was a man that size. God always takes a foolish and ignorant things to, like that to do his work with, you see. He takes something as nothing. So this little fellow was standing out there. And all at once, here come these Philistines and surrounded him to kill him. And he took the jawbone of a mule that was laying there. A wild one of little donkeys picked up the jawbone of that mule and the Spirit of the Lord came on him. <laughs> and that was a paradox. <laughs> How did he beat down with the jawbone of a mule through that half inch thick helmet over the top of the head with the jawbone of the mule? <laughs> well, the first, that old dry jawbone in there, the first lick he would have hit it, it burst it into a thousand pieces. Or the top of one of those helmets. Or those big shields. When a thousand rushed in upon him and he beat every one of them to death. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. Paradox. That's when the Spirit of God come upon him. Oh, if we could only be jawbones. <laughs> in the hand of God. There'd be another paradox. Yes, it was. It was a paradox. When Jesus, our Lord, took five biscuits and two little fish and broke them and fed 5,000 and taken up baskets full of remaining little parcels that some of them didn't. They'd lay four or five fish down at this table and four or five loaves of bread and then they'd go over here and lay four or five loaves of bread and some of them couldn't even eat it all. They just left them laying there so they picked them up, baskets full of them. Oh, See? How did he do it? It's incredible that a man could take five biscuits and two little fishes and feed 5,000 and take up seven baskets full. Amen. Left over. It's incredible. But he did it. Amen. Why? It was God. Yes. It's a paradox. <laughs> it's incredible, but it, it, he did it. It was incredible. And never before or after... On a stormy sea. And the waves so high till it was sinking a ship. When a man come walking down across those waves. I just see every time the the great big white cap comes around him, just bursts and falls down towards the bottom and he walks right on. It's like he's on a piece of concrete. Walking up on the sea. Amen. In time of a storm. Let science figure that one out. What held him up there? What kept him on that sea when it's a half a mile deep right in there? When those great waves, many times bigger than this tabernacle, splash him up, why, fill the little boat and waterlogged it. Just wet inside and out. 
and it was sinking. The mast poles had broke down and the oars was gone. And all hopes of being saved was gone. And here comes somebody walking on the water. Oh, A paradox. Sure. Incredible. It cannot be explained, but he did it. Amen. Oh, yes. He did it. Come walking on the water. It's incredible that this same one, oh, God, Hallelujah. I hope this drives home. Amen. Incredible. A real paradox that this same one, Jesus of Nazareth, would choose a bunch of ignorant fishermen for his church instead of the well-trained priests and denominations of that day. Amen. How that a God that had all wisdom that could walk on the waters, that could turn water into wine, that could take a five biscuits and feed 5,000 people and take up seven baskets full left over. How did that same one, the God that sets in eternity on her, that's the so bright to the sun, hide their face from him? Hallelujah. The very pool of wisdom and purity of understanding and knowledge supreme of the Supremes. And he would come to a place where a great organization of churches had all gathered together and trained all their men, and he'd go down and pick up a bunch of dirty, stinking fishermen that couldn't even write their own name and choose that type of man to set the church in order for his bride. Strange thing, isn't it? Yes. Looks like at least he took somebody who was trained. He's a trainer. Amen. Amen. He's the one who does it. Strange that he had did it. Instead of taking church man, he took fisherman yes. to do it. Very odd. Amen. But that's why he does it. Amen. It's true. It's a real paradox. When God took a bunch of ignoramuses, as we'd call them today, holy rollers, poor of this world's goods, and poured out the Holy Ghost on them in the upper room instead of pouring it out upon the Sanhedrin Council amen. where all the theologians sat, yeah, where all the great men was, where the head of all the churches, where the ones that had studied in the Scriptures and had made a great school, well-trained and waiting for the coming Messiah. And knowing if they'd be the one who'd walk out and meet him and say, Messiah, you came down as if on an airplane's wings. You sat down here on the temple steps. We seen you come down to heaven from the golden carters of heaven. Now, we're all trained and ready to go to work. We got our schooling. We got our Bachelor of Art. We got our PhD, LLD, and all this. We're all trained here. We stand 10,000 strong. We're ready for you. Come on. We're waiting. Calling come. But instead of that, he goes down and gets a bunch of people that didn't hardly know right hand from left. Hallelujah. That's right. And put them in the upper room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And poured out his spirit. Oh, oh God. Yeah. Upon a bunch of people like that. Instead of taking the Sanhedrin council, he took fishermen. Isn't it strange that he didn't use their educations? It pleased God. It seems to please God to make his own church a paradox. The same thing he's doing right now. Making a paradox out of his church. Bypassing all the great highfalutin and all this stuff there, the so-called church, and he'll, anybody that he can get into his hand, it'll open their eyes and see what's truth. And test it with the Word of God in the time that we're living. And place them into the body. A paradox. God chooses such. He makes His church a paradox. Odd people. Strange people. All these up there in the upper room. Come out there speaking in another language. Staggering like drunk people. Staggering and carrying on. Women. His own, own mother. And all of them in the upper room come out there jabbering something that nobody could understand what they were doing at first. They had cloven tongues set up on them. Cloven means parted. No one understood what they were doing. They're jabbering around there, acting like they were drunk. And there stood a 
bunch of people who were trained scholars of the gospel. Theologians. But God chose God to take and lead them set in their ignorance with their highly smart educations and come over here and picked up this bunch of guys that didn't know their ABCs and poured out His Spirit upon them. Made a paradox out of it. Yes. God does that. He does that for His own purpose. He makes His church a paradox. I believe in Him. Amen. I believe it. Yes. Amen. So help me God, I believe the Word. Amen. Let every man's Word be a lie and this be true. Amen. Amen. What this Word says do, let's do it the way this Word says do it. Amen. No matter how funny it seems and how odd you get to be or anything like that, stay with the Word. Amen. If you're called old-fashioned, you're called this, that, or that, what do you care anyhow? Stay Amen. with this Word. Amen. This is it, the truth. Yes. Don't take what someone else says. Take what the Word says. Amen. Here's some time ago a minister friend. I just heard this told. I believe it. One hot afternoon down in Georgia, he was visiting with this a druggist. The old druggist was a, a fine old Christian brother, full of the Spirit of God. And he said, come in and sit down and let's have a, a Coke. They were sitting there drinking a Coke. He said, I want to say something to you. And you perhaps will not believe this. Well, let's hear it first, said the minister. He said, I have always tried to do my best for God. He was a deacon in a church. He said, I've always tried to live to my calling and do that which was right. He said, I've never cheated anybody. I've always testified for my Lord everywhere I could. And he said, I've to my drugs here said I've tried to carry the very highest class that could be bought. I've never overcharged anybody. I've tried to do everything was right that I know how to do to serve the Lord. He said, I'm going to tell you what happened. Said my son, who is studying to be a druggist too, to follow me. He was in the front of the building there one day. And said he was doing a time of the depression. Said a little lady walked into the, the door. And said, uh, you could see what her trouble was. And uh, she is to be a mother. And her husband, both of them poorly dressed, said they give the prescription to, over to my uh, son. And said uh, to have it filled, for the woman was in need of this certain thing that the doctor had prescribed for her. And said, uh, uh, he said, this will be uh, so much, such and such. When the the uh, to be father asked, "How much will it be?" So and so, he said, "Sir, I will not be able to get the prescription fulfilled or filled." He said, "Because that I haven't any money." Well, he said, "My son said, go right down the street there, just a half a block or a block, and turn left, and you'll see where the the place is where they have charity." And you go there to the county, and they will perhaps uh, give you um, uh, 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 the money to have or, or an order that they'll pay for this prescription because uh, it's got the lady has to have the, the, the medicine right away. And said so he went out of the place, started, and said so he listened to his son, and something said, oh, no, don't do that. Said so that woman needs that. Said so he had to think. That long line of people down there, it's hard for a well man to stand in the line, let alone a mother in that condition. So I said to my son, go call him. Tell him to come back. He said, and I rushed to the door and said, come back, come back. And they come back. And I said to my son, fill that. There's no charge. And said, my son, give me the prescription. And I went over and had it filled and filled it up the best that I could and brought it out. To give to the lady and tell her that uh, there'd be no charges on this. That was all right because she was in need of it real bad. And, and uh, I'd get by without it. So uh, the money for it. So said I just started to lay the medicine in her hand. And when I did, I looked at the hand. They were scarred. Then I looked up and 
I was putting it in Jesus' hand. But I learned then that the scriptures, what it meant in so much as you've done unto the least of these, my little ones. Said, do you believe that? The fellow said to me, yeah, why, sure I believe that. It was a paradox. Incredible. But it's true. How about the great St. Martin of Taurus, France? When he, being a soldier, was one night coming down a cold, dark street, and there was a, in this cold, dark street, laid an old bum laying on the street, freezing. His blood was freezing in his veins. And Martin, yet not a Christian. And anyone who's read Bible history knows of St. Martin, the historian the other day that was trying to get his uh, card. That's the one I picked for the, for the third church age, St. Martin, because he had signs following. And St. Martin looked down before he, he was a soldier. And there lay this old man laying in the street freezing. And he looked, he had one coat. Without the coat, he had freed. Tuck his knife and cut the coat in half. Wrapped the bum up in it. Put the other half around himself and went walking on. That night when he got into his room and had sat down, he heard someone come into the room. He looked, here come Jesus, wrapped in that piece of coat. That was his call to the ministry. He become a saint. He spoke in tongues. His school was trained. He trained his people right with the word of God. He didn't care about what the first church of Rome or any of them said. Amen. He stayed right with the word of God. He taught them speaking in tongues and laying hands on the sick. They raised the dead. They cast out devils. One man, his friend, had been killed. And he went and laid his body over mass. He could see him a few minutes. He and his buddy come walking out together. <clears throat> Why? There's a paradox. Sure, God did it. I believe in paradox. Yes, amen. Yes, sir. I believe. I amen. believe in him with all my heart. Amen. Yeah. It was a paradox. When all the smart men there was in the world, and God put the key to the kingdom in the hands of the one that was considered the ignorant and unlearned. That's right. Yeah. One of the smartest men in the world in that day was Cephas as a high priest. Another was the emperors and the kings and the great men of the earth, like presidents and so forth. All these great men. And what's the most important thing in the world is God's church. God made the earth. He made it for a purpose to take a church out of it, a bride. And that's the most important job in the world. And the smartest man he had was emperors and kings and potentates and monarchs, high priests and church men. He could have took any of those. But it was a paradox when he called a man who couldn't even sign his own name and said, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind it in heaven. What you loose on earth, I'll loose it in heaven. Say, I just thought of that, about that vision. What you loose or bind. Amen. Amen. What you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Yeah. What you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. Yes. yes. He gave that. Not to a learned high priest, Caiaphasus, but to an ignorant fisherman. Truly a paradox. We see Paul, a little old hook-nosed Jew, on his road down, irrigant, going down to bind them people, making that noise and shouting and things, throwing them in jail and making havoc of the church, stoned Stephen's witness to it in health or coats. He was a, he was a terrier. How would God ever choose a man like that? And look, the bishops, all the apostles, they said, we'll make a choice. Somebody to take Judas's place. And who do they choose? They chose Matthias. <coughs> Matthias, I believe it's called. Matthias. Yeah, yeah Matthias. They chose him by casting lots. And not one thing did he ever do. He seemed to be a righteous man. And God chose the most high-tempered, meanest guy there was in the land to take his place. Paradox. That's what God does. Paradox. It was a paradox. Well, this ungodly, high-headed, high-tempered, mean, despisable Jew was on his road down 
one day to a city to bind the Christians and put them in jail. And when all at once he was stricken down. And when he looked up, there stood that pillar of fire. And a voice coming saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It was a paradox when he could see it and the rest of them couldn't see it. See? Somebody said, well, I never see that. There's no such a thing there. there you don't. That's wrong. But this, today they say this. I don't believe such. No, sure not. Certainly not. But there's there, those there that does see it. Amen. Sure, if you can't, you're blind, you can't see it. A fellow said to me some time ago, been several years ago, said, now, if I'm in your way, he said, uh, now, Paul struck a man blind. He said, if I be the devil, he said, you strike me blind. I said, it, I don't necessarily have to be done. You're already blind. See? You're already blind. You're the worst kind of blindness. See? I said, Anne in the temple could see farther than you can see. And she was blind. Physically. He's blind spiritually. Sure. It was a paradox. It was a paradox when God made so-called heresy. All this noise and shouting and praising God and speaking in tongues and people who despised and rejected and called idiots and heretics. It's a paradox when God, the great Father of all, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who chose a bunch of heretics to bring salvation to his church instead of the well-trained ecclesiastical theological system. It's a paradox. Not long ago, I was in a city in Washington, or I believe it was Oregon, and there was a, a reporter come. Two little reporters had cigarettes in their hand. They come in, they just go to write me up. Sure, really good, you know. And they were going on saying this thing and another thing. And he said, um, and, uh, and uh, are you a holy roller? I said, no. I said, I haven't never rolled, but I said, I, I guess if he'd tell me to roll, I would. And so I went ahead talking like that, you know, and she was going, and uh, she said, all oh, going on. I said, just let me tell you something, little lady. You write up anything you want to. You're Catholic. She said, that's right. I said, how'd you know I was Catholic? I said, well, it's the same way I know there's other things on the platform. I said, you're a Catholic, and you go on and write it up. But I'm warning you right now, in 30 days from now, you write it up, and you'll be laying on the side of a road with your throat cut by glass off your own car, <laughs> screaming for mercy, and you'll think of me many times. She said, aren't you Irish? Yeah. Was your people Catholic? I said, perhaps for me. So what would your mother think of uh, such uh, about you doing the way? I said, I baptized her in the name of Jesus Christ and she received the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Yes. I said, now, if you want to go in that way, then I'll take your name and you take my name. Then if it isn't so, then after 30 days you write it up in the paper that I'm a false prophet. Now you go ahead and write it. She said, well, I'd hate to think when I got to heaven that a bunch of ignoramuses like up there at that meeting would be ruling heaven. I said, you won't have much trouble. I said, don't think, I don't, if you, unless you change your mind and your way, you won't be there anyhow. See? I said, because they'll be there. God has chosen that. It's a paradox that God has taken the foolish. See, Them things that God chose to bring salvation to the world through such a bunch. A paradox. Altogether different from their high trained and polished scholars and theologians and things. God just bypasses that. Takes some of the league of and raises it up and puts his message in like did John, some of the rest of them, Peter and them, send them on out and preach the gospel and bring in his church and save them and bring them back to the earth and that's all there is to it, see. And just let all this great polished stuff go. Oh, my. <laughs> it sure is something. <clears throat> I, God, when God chose the ignorant and unlearned instead of the education and learned for his bride. Could you imagine a man choosing his bride would take a man with the highest, uh, highest supreme powers? I got a little something here I want to say, but I, I won't have time to say it about a little parable I seen one time, but I won't be able to say it. 
I had it jotted down here, but I haven't got time for it. But God chose His bride out of a bunch of people like that. Now, anybody say that that isn't so, then you don't believe your Bible. That's, right. Amen. That's exactly right. Read your Bible. That's exactly what right. It was a real paradox when God chose the foolishness of inspired preaching instead of high-polished theology. A man that don't know how to use hit, paint, tote, fetch, carry, all such words as that, and, and say all kinds of uh, things uh, out of his grammar and ungrammarized and everything else like that. And God chose that instead of taking the great, scholarly, polished, who can really pronounce the words and say it just right. But it pleased God to take the foolishness of inspired preaching. Some of the little plowboy don't know his ABCs. And take that man and win souls by him when deceivers all polished up is lead him blind leading the blind. A real paradox. Oh, the words are full of it. Many contexts here are texts I have to the, um, <laughs> bypass. It's true that the big church shines and glitters with polished theology while the kingdom glows with humble. Poor and humble. The gospel don't shine. It glows. Fool's goal shines. Real goal glows. There's a difference between a glow and a shine. We know that. While the big church glitters and shines with high polished scholars, fine pews, crucifix all over the wall, and the highest of finest of structures and buildings and great towering things, all like that. The little kingdom down in some little alley like here somewhere is glowing with the glory of God, filled with the humble and heart. See? God working in them, healing the sick and raising the dead and casting out devils and so forth like that, just letting them pass on by. There was a great minister. Don't you forget this. There was a great ministerial meeting here some time ago. In a certain city where some people from right here was at the meeting. And they had a certain man who was going to, oh, he was a theologian. He had the message for the day for the people. And he'd studied for two or three weeks on it. That was all right. And when he walked up to the platform, not a wrinkle in his clothes, my, with the finest of uh, things on, you know, walked up and stuck out his chest and laid all of his, his material out for his message. And he really preached an hour's message that could not be touched intellectually. Oh, how he stuck out his chest and tucked the name of L.L. Dr. So-and-so from a certain big school that was so highly polished and scholar that he brought such a masterpiece to the people of psychology and things that it was wonderful. But a Christian sitting there just like at the Nicene Council, it just grieved the spirit. Oh, it was a masterpiece, sure. Yes, sir, it had all the polish on it could be. But the real spirit-filled people just, it just didn't go. There was no spirit there to back it up. So when he come down, he had his head dug down. He seen it didn't go over right. He was from another school, and he's with Pentecostal people. So when he come down off the platform, his feathers was dropped down. Start walking down through there with all his stuff under his arm like this, walking down through the congregation. There was a wise old saint sitting over on the right-hand side, reached over to another man and said, if he would have went up the way that he come down, he would have come down the way he went up. <laughs> That's it! Amen. Hallelujah. If he'd have went up humble, he'd have probably come down till with the glory. If he would have went up the way he come down, he would have come down the way he went up. Amen. It's right. A paradox. Listen, in closing now, just for a moment, for the prayer line, I want to say another word about, too about paradox. The old prophet's visions is still a paradox. Amen. It's untouched. Who can say that a man 4,000 years ago could spoke of the horseless carriage just jostling through the broadways against one another. Amen. The Old Testament prophets 
how they could foresee things and foretell it, lifted up by the power of God that saw it way in the years to come and foretold it to the accuracy of perfection. Amen. Explain it. It's a paradox. Oh, another one. I want to give you a little one, insignificant. But my conversion was a paradox. I say this with love and respect. My parents has gone on. My mother's people were all sinners. Trappers, hunters, mountain people. My father's people were all drunkards. Bootleggers, gamblers, gun shooters, killing one another. Most all of them died with their shoes on. There wasn't a speck of religion anyway to us. And how did God... What was that? It came into that little old log cabin up there that morning that you see pictured on that wall there. What? It's altogether different. If you put a grain of wheat in the ground, it'll bear a grain of wheat. You put corn in the ground, it'll bear corn. You put a cucklebur in the ground, it'll bear a cucklebur. But this is the paradox. Each one of you can say the same thing about yourself. We all can think of a paradox. But what happened? Here's another paradox. How can me, after preaching nearly 30 years, could still dread that thought of going on her? How could it be, after being preaching since I was a little boy, and now I hear a man 52 years old, and then think of dreading, I, I didn't, I don't know what I was saved, but was dreading of the thought. But the love of God one morning came down in my room, lifted me up, and took me into a place where the redeemed was. Amen. Indeed, a paradox. Amen. I want to ask you something. I might cut this off here now. I want to ask you something. What is that on my picture there? Where did it come from? What's it here for? Science can't deny it. What is it in the meeting that stands there and combs the people through and tells them? Back out of what you did. You're here for this purpose. You're here for that. It's incredible to the scientific mind. Now, we know telepathy. Telepathy is say something like, you're saying something and I can say the same thing, see? Or, I'm reading your mind. It's happening right then. But when you see, then it tells things that will happen way out yonder. Amen. That leaves telepathy alone. Amen. It's incredible that God in this last days, as He promised He'd do, would do such a thing. Amen. But it's true. It's a paradox. I believe it. I believe the same God that's always had paradoxes showed him he's the same God today because he keeps his word. I believe it. Science cannot deny it. There it is. On the mechanical camera. It's a paradox. God. What is it? And in Exodus, the 13th chapter, we read that God gave the children of Israel, which was a type of the church today, as they journeyed naturally, we're journeying in the Spirit. Next Sunday, we're taking that now. It remembers all on that, see? Now, how that, that where they are went on the ground materially like this, and God was with them, the church is seated with Christ in heavenly places and the spiritual realms are going with all dominions under our feet. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. And they had a pillar of fire, a light that they followed. Wherever this light went, they followed that light. Thousands of years has passed. Hundreds and hundreds of years has went by. And they're still alive. A paradox. The same yesterday, 
fulfilling the scripture. It's here for our witness. Not because of us. But because it, God promised it. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. was the one that Moses esteemed the riches of Christ, of the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. And what was the Christ that went before him? A light, a pillar of fire. He said, I come from God and I return to God. He did. A little while in the world won't see me no more, yet you shall see me. For I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Right down at the end of the world, he'd be there too. Amen. Here we are. Amen. After his death, burial, and resurrection, St. Paul met him on the road down to Damascus. He was back to that pillar of fire. Yes. Almost 2,000 years has passed since then, and here he is. Amen. Oh, amen. Not amongst the denominations. No. Not amongst the high, polished scholars of the day, but a bunch of poor and humble. A paradox. A paradox. To those who love him, believe him, thousands around the world who believed him. It's to fulfill his promise of both New and Old Testament. That's what it is, but it's a paradox. It was a paradox when God promised to give the kingdom to a little flock instead of a great organized church. Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. It will, it's a paradox. It's a paradox. It'll be a real paradox. One of these days when Jesus comes. And the dead in Christ will rise. This mortal takes on immortality and the rapture of the church comes. And this Christmas time when people are shopping and dancing and drinking and celebrating something that they know nothing about like he was celebrating Washington or Lincoln's birthday. And not worshiping the... they still got God in a manger. When God's not in a manger. He's raised from the dead and alive forevermore. Living among us. Proving himself as the same God that the Nicene fathers carried and down through the ages has come since the day of Pentecost. The same God that met Paul on the road to Damascus. He was a missionary to the Gentile and a messenger from God to the Gentiles. The Gentiles' message started by a visitation of the pillar of fire. And it ends the same way. The Gentile kingdom started off. The kingdom of the world, that's the world, started off with a rebuke from a heavenly language in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar ends up the same thing as the Holy Ghost poured out upon the Gentile church in the last days to rebuke the Gentile nations again with the handwriting on the wall. The handwriting on the wall that God has prepared His church. He's prepared His people. He's prepared His place. And they're waiting for Him to come. And that rapture when the trumpet of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. We which are alive and remain shall not hinder them that's asleep. For the trumpet of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise, and we shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. A paradox one of these mornings. When the graves open and the dead walks out. When the ones who are living will be changed in a moment of a twinkling of an eye and go up in the air to meet Him. The whole thing is a paradox. God moving amongst His people. Do you believe that? Amen. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. God, now for over an hour and about an hour and ten minutes, we have stood here speaking of past and present events, of how the Holy Spirit, dividing them, Lord, as the Word of God has so graciously did, showing that the very God of heaven who lived in the old days in the same form, in the same way, lives today. The same wonders and the same power that was upon the prophets of old, that was upon the church at Pentecost, was upon the Hana and upon Agathus, the prophets of the New Testament in that day, who even corrected St. Paul. And St. Paul got in trouble but not listening to Agathus. 
Because Antipas, though he was an apostle, Paul was, but Antipas had the word of the Lord. And he warned him not to go up there. But Paul was determined to go. And then he got in trouble. And Father, always we get in trouble if we disobey the word of God. We see that the very God that was with those brethren there is the same God today we see him in every manifestation. And it is a paradox, Lord. The world looks and shakes her head and says there's nothing to it. The believer accepts it and embraces it and knows that it's a living God. Oh, Father, we pray this morning that if there would be someone among us who has not yet been a believer, that this will be the hour that they will believe. Oh, God, grant just now in the heart of every person that, you're, that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that this will be the hour that there will be a paradox before them that a vile, wretched sinner, by nature a sinner, born in the world in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies through filth, could be changed and made in the righteousness of the Son of God. Grant, Lord, that that, that great paradox will take place in the hearts of all here this morning who doesn't know Thee as their Savior and their coming King and are ready to meet Thee at the last trump, if it should sound today. Then we would pray also, Lord, that You would remember those here that are sick and afflicted. Oh, God, today we pray that You'll heal every person that's sick or afflicted. Let them know that God still performs paradox to anyone who will make it come to pass his word we know his word is a paradox when it promises something so unreal to the world something that they cannot uh, prescribe to it's it's something beyond their knowledge and, and understanding but when a simple heart will take that word and sink it into the depths of its being then that Word produces the life facts of that promise. Oh, how we thank Thee for this, that there is simple people that believe this message. We're not looking for a kingdom to where that atomic ages will rule, but we're looking for a kingdom that Christ will rule in the power and majesty of peace and glory upon the earth. Not where we will press our feet to automobile gas pedals or fly through the air with jet planes, but where we'll sit around the throne of the living God. Oh, and look upon Him and see the one who was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace upon Him and with whose stripes we were healed. Our hearts desire, Lord, since the great paradox has come to us, that we will reach Him and set with Him uh, at that day, grant it, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. And while we have our heads bowed, I wonder in the audience this morning if anybody would like to be remembered in prayer and say, Lord God, I raise my hand to you. And Brother Bram, you're going to look and see my hand and pray for me that a great paradox will take place in my heart that when I'll meet Christ in the baptism of the Spirit and the power of His resurrection, God bless you, each and every one. That's fine. And I'll meet God. God be with you. I'll meet Him in a great paradox will take place in my life and I'll be filled with His power and His glory and the goodness and mercy of Him that liveth forever and ever. And someday I'll be included in that paradox that's coming. Something that when the dust of those prophets lays down in the earth, when the dust of the martyrs who were eat up by lions and with the dung of the lions is spread across the dust and all over the earth. But yet Christ will raise that body again. It goes to show that He is the resurrection. When He took a little mud from His hands and put them on the eyes of a man who never had eyes, showed that man was made from the dust of the earth. And He returned with eyeballs and could see the Creator that made Him. If God don't intend to raise the dead, then why did He become flesh like us and go back towards the dust and raise Himself up again? Why did He raise Himself up if there is no resurrection of the dead? Oh, let us not be children, but let us be men and women in the Spirit. Believe God with all of our heart. Would there be another now before we start praying? God bless you. You, my brethren. You. Yes. 
Our Heavenly Father, now we bring to you these that's raised their hands. Somehow or another, the Holy Spirit has made its way down into their hearts. They're telling them, you are not here just to eat and drink and, and to sleep and to get up and work and then go back, eat and drink and sleep again. You are here to be sons and daughters of God. You are here to take your position and place in Christ. And I am here this morning to call you, would say the Holy Spirit, to their life. Father, with prayer, the only weapon that I know of, I present them to you. And I, I defy the enemy that would keep them from you. I place by faith the blood of Jesus Christ between the enemy and them that would keep them from this glorious experience of this great paradox of receiving the Holy Spirit and having eternal life. For we realize that's the only, only thing that there is, the only solution that's given to us for eternal life is to have God's life in us, then it's eternal life in us. Grant it, Lord, that it'll happen to everyone who raised their hands and perhaps those who did not have the courage to raise their hands. Grant it to them also. Now, Father, they are yours. I present them to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And now, as the prayer line is to be formed, Father, I don't know who will be coming up here, but give us another paradox this morning, Lord. May some great mysterious power of God move down and do something as you promised. And this will be my first time, Lord, since the meeting with you the other day. I pray now that you will grant the request of the people through Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I wish that everyone... Well, just be seated if you can for just a moment. Now, anyone that has a prayer card, Billy come down this morning as he promised he would and gave out prayer cards to some people here. He said there wasn't very many. Would you raise up your hands, the ones that's got a prayer cards? All right. I wonder if you just take your place and stand right along here, uh, those who have prayer cards. For Billy, where are you at? All right. Stand right along here. I ever wanted prayer now. We're coming before our Lord God. Sing that song with the music, if you will, it's sister. All together, now, quietly.
Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. Jesus answering said unto him, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, that what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Jesus said once, when they couldn't understand that he was who he was, he said, if you can't believe me, believe the works that I do. And if I don't do the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do the works of my Father, then you believe the works. I've got just through this morning bringing the message of of a paradox. A paradox is something that's it's unreasonable, but it's um, it's uh, really incredible, says Webster. But it's true. Something is incredible. It's, you can't understand it. It's just a mystery. Jesus did the works of his Father because the Father was in him. That's why the works was done, because that the Father was in the Son. you believe that? That in him he was the incarnate God. Do you believe that? That God the Father, which is the Father of Jesus Christ, the Great Spirit, dwelt in the fullness of his power in Jesus Christ, which was the tabernacle of God made flesh and dwelt on earth, representing the Word. Jesus was the Word. The Bible says so, St. John, the first chapter. And the Word was invisible. Now listen close. The Word was invisible until it was made flesh. And then the Word became visible. And through His sacrificial death at Calvary and His resurrection, positionally placed His church in that realm that the same invisible God could come into the individual and make the Word visible. Oh, I wish my church could get that. If you could see, friend, the invisible God made visible. Now listen, let's study it again. I've often wanted to come into a church. I've longed to see it, I guess. Where I could walk in the back door, front door, wherever it was, look across an audience, and see a perfect church. All in order. Sin couldn't stay there. No, the Spirit called it out. See, it just couldn't stay. Like Ananias or Pius, you, you just couldn't do it. There'd be no sin in that, that group. No sin. See, the Spirit quickly speak it like that. No matter what it was, how little it would be done. See, women, man, sitting there. Under the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God moving perfectly. Moving this. Someone had done something wrong in the congregation. Couldn't they be? They couldn't. They'd, they'd come quickly and confess it before the spirit got a hold of it. To confess it before they come tell it, because they know right then it's going to be called. That's, right. That's the church of the living God. How my old poor old heart, not getting old, how long to stand still, church like that. I may yet. Uh, I hope to. Perfect works of God, not sin. Now, it could understand. Now, here stands a group of people to be prayed for. Now, we realize if this scripture is true, and the God of heaven who could create a squirrel, could create a ram, could stop the sun for a whole day, 24 hours, that could keep fire from burning people in a furnace for three hours, it could stop the mouth of lions, God could raise the dead, could walk on water, could take biscuits and feed 5,000. 
That's God. Amen. That's the Word made flesh in human beings. Amen. Does everybody understand that? Yes. Now, this same God promised that in the last days these things would reappear again. But He can't do it until there's somebody He can work with and work on. You see what I mean? Amen. Now, let's believe that emphatically with all of our heart that it's going to be that way. Now, here stands a group of people, most of them I know. I think, I, I, I don't think this first woman here in front, this girl, I don't think I know her. I know Brother Way and the sister of the next there, Brother Roberson or Porter's wife, and um, I don't know the next man. I ought to know the next woman. I don't know. I don't think I do. Yes, I do. And the next the man stand there, I find out this thing that's Brother Dalton's son. And uh, along the road there, I practically know everybody in there. I don't have no idea who the people are, where they come from. But now what they need for now is prayer. Some of them, of course, is beyond. They cannot grasp just exactly what it is. Now I want each one of you to look this way a minute. Each one of you in a prayer. If I could help you, I would do so. And I'm here to help you. But the only way I'll ever be able to do it, to restore back what Satan has done to you, is you to believe me. If you'll just believe me with all your heart, it'll be done. Now, I used to be, in my ministry, it would cause visions. Visions would spring up, and I could tell the people what they were for. You, how many have seen that done? All, all of them, see? That's right. Yeah, I can still do it. Oh, I can still be done. Sure, yeah. That's right. But we're coming to something greater than that now. We're rising above that. We're coming to that spoken word. And Satan will have to do it. It'll time and a knot. I can only get you to believe it. But you doubt it. Here, if you want to know whether I'm telling you the truth, if the Holy Spirit's here, I know what that girl's wrong with that girl. I don't know her, but I know what's wrong. Sure. Yeah. That's exactly right. And he's just battling at me as hard as he can, but he'll have to give it up. Oh, you believe it. Just don't you doubt it, sister. Don't doubt it. It's all right, sister. You, you're going to get it. It's going to be all right. Here's a colored man looking at me. He's standing there in a the line. I don't know you, but God knows you. If I tell you what's your trouble, will you believe me to be his prophet? You will? You're not here for yourself. That child in the hospital will get well if you believe it. You believe that with all your heart? Then we'll go back to your seat. I pronounce the power of God upon the child. The devil will turn it loose. Little Dalton looking at you. You're for that baby. That baby's got something wrong with his navel, hasn't it? Go back to your seat and believe it and let's get all right. I'm looking at another woman. It's Miss Stricker. Miss Stricker, I haven't talked to you for months. I have no idea what you're here for. You believe God can tell me what's your trouble? Would it make all three of you believe? You're here for that kid that's got something wrong with his leg. Then you're praying for a friend in Africa. That's exactly right. That's thus saith the Lord. Now, if that's right, Miss Stricker, raise up your hand. He's here. See? For that, that ministry... Will always be. But here comes another. You believe now, don't you doubt? Don't know what I be doubt. When I lay hands on you and ask this to be done, it's going to be done. The only thing is just like taking God's word. The only thing, if you don't believe it, it won't. If you do believe it, it's got to happen. Or something happened the other night up there, and I know the very God that could create can do it. All right? I want everybody to bow your heads. Everybody in prayer. <laughs> Cows and pebbles that bound Sharon, this lovely little girl. The God who gave you the vision the other night of that devil being found and said it's too scared to even find me. And the sin scared in my heart for this child. I come, Lord, to ask mercy and favor of you for her. 
Something just lifted me up. <laughs> just exactly the way he said it would do. <laughs> a paradox. <laughs> and when the Spirit was on me so, I could look down the line and see those things that those people were wanting. <laughs> so at least three or four of them or something, and it might be a confirmation witness that God never takes a gift that's a true gift. He just adds to it. He just keeps building higher and higher. Now I believe with all my heart that you're healed. <laughs> I believe it with all that's in me. I, I believe it. Now, if Jesus invited you to come to salvation, if you'd come, you'd get it. Because he promised it. He promised it. Now, let's not doubt it, but let's believe it with all of our heart. Now, don't fight at it. Just know that it's got to be done. It has to be done. Jesus said, speak this word. Don't you doubt it. And he was the very one, and those visions, so far as I know, with all my heart, not one time have they failed. Not one time. And he said the other night, and those, that vision I told you, before God who I stand, that is true. See? He's seen that serpent bound. He said, you'll have to be more sincere. That's what I'm striving for, is more sincere. And each one coming along this morning, I tried to think, if that was my mother to those women, if that was my sister sitting back there, if that was my wife sitting back there, or one of my children sitting back there, what if it was them trying to place myself in their position to be sincere? And if you notice, the very, I just happens to come to my memory, over the other day, when I was in California, and stand at that businessman's breakfast, I think I've got it here, I'm pretty sure I was looking at it, just a while ago, a prophecy that was given. Here it is right here. <clears throat> this was given after standing and preaching a hard sermon. And uh, people are here this morning. Brother Roy Borders, for one, that was there, I believe, uh, where Roy's at, was uh, yeah, sitting here. Was there when this taken place and many others that were there. When a uh, boy that was a Baptist, it was... Uh, uh, Jane Russell's cousin, the movie star. Anything can come in that breakfast that wants to come. And when I got through speaking, 
The boy walked over and put his arms around me and said, when I come off the one platform down to another to speak to the congregation, with several hundred was present, and I was speaking on a, a broadcast that went across the nation at 9 o'clock the following night. It was being taped then. And when this, uh, I stepped down on this next level to speak another time to these people here, and one of the great denominations had, one of their great men was standing there and was resenting the message. See, by saying, I was talking about I was over in Phoenix a few days before I hadn't seen several different fruits growing on one tree. I seen on an orange tree, it was grapefruit, lemons, and uh, I believe tangerines and tangelos and all them different things growing because it's a citrus tree. But I said, every year it blooms and puts forth new fruits. But there's only those original branches. When, it, when the real tree itself brings forth another branch, it puts out the same kind of fruit that it is in stock. But these other trees are bearing their fruit, although they're living off the, fr the life of this tree. I said, that's like organizations being placed into the vine. Jesus said, I'm the vine. And every time that vine puts forth a branch, it'll be just like the vine. <laughs> so you'll have the same fruit. Well, this great minister of the biggest Pentecostal organization we had was standing there and resented it. See, said that I didn't mean it that way. But I got back and said, I do mean it that way. Amen. See? I said, uh, exactly. I take nothing back. The other day when I spoke about those altars, not knowing, never seeing that in history, I never have said nothing yet in the platform under inspiration that I ever had to take back. Amen. Uh, you can call that cedar serpent or whatever you wish to, whatever that message was, or the great harlot that so much kick is against. Just come, won't you come to me with the scriptures with it? See, Amen. See what it's right. This man come up there, put his arms around me, and was going to say, he said, Brother Brennan, not to be sacrilegious, but that could have made the 23rd chapter of Revelations. You know, another book added. Of course, he said that wouldn't be right. Of course, we're not supposed to add anything to it. And just as he started to say that, he started speaking in tongues. And the boy didn't know what speaking in tongues meant. And as soon as he did, right out in front of me was a French woman from Louisiana. She said that needed no interpretation. That was pure French. And a man over here got up and said, that's right. And way back in the back was the interpreter for the UN. Give his name. Never been there before. He said, correctly, that's right. And here's what they got together. And each one of them had the same thing. When they come together, each one of the ones given the interpretation exactly. And this Frenchman, the second one over here, he wrote it out because he'd been taking minutes of the meeting. Here's what he wrote. I, Victor Deluxe, am a Frenchman full-blooded, born-again Christian, filled with the Holy Spirit. I live at 809 North King Road, Los Angeles, 46. Attend Bethel Temple. Army Vic is our pastor. Uh, Pentecostal minister, biggest Pentecostal church in Los Angeles. A translation of a prophecy over Brother Branham given by Danny Henry in French, February the 11th, 1961, at the full gospel businessman's breakfast, a true translation of the prophecy. All three of them said, this is it. Because thou hast chosen the narrow path. See, just against, I'd have to walk by yourself. See, I can understand that. Moses had to make his choice too. See, he didn't have to do it, but he did it. See, the harder way, thou, see, because thou hast chosen the narrow path, the harder way thou has made, thou has walked of your own choosing. In other words, I didn't have to do it. I can side in, go with them if I want to, but I stay with the, won't stay at the word. Thou has picked the correct and precise decision, and it is my way, if you'll notice, it's punctuated and underlined. And if you notice, it's wrote in French, it's spoken French, verb before the adverb, see? Because of this momentous decision, a huge portion of heaven awaits thee. Now, that's what I wonder when I die. Will it be? Now, I have to think, heaven's not portioned off to different portions to us up there. Heaven is a kingdom of heaven that's within us. One waits far. See? Now, watch. What a glorious decision thou hast made. This in itself is that which will give and make come to pass their tremendous victory in the love divine. See, we say it in the tremendous victory in the divine love. But in French, it would be love divine. It's like German or any other city that the, put the verb before the adverb. Now you see what coming down to Jordan meant? We're down here now. Let's cross over now. Amen. Let's quit playing. Let's cross the other side now because it all belongs to us. It's all ours. Hallelujah. Man's visions has never failed. No. They can't fail. 
because they come from God. Amen. I believe it with all that is within me. We're not the hiding that will run back into the wilderness. We'll cross Jordan. The separation. God break to us the seals that's on the back of the book. Let us enter into this great place now. For Joshua divided to the people their inheritance that God had left for them. And if you notice, those Hebrew mothers, when they were in labor and gave birth to those patriarchs, I'll get on that one of these days, the Lord willing, and gave birth to those patriarchs, when she spoke their name in labor, she also positionally placed them in their place Amen. in the kingdom. Oh, my. Inspiration is, is a paradox. See, you just can't catch it. But it's inspired and God moves it right into its place. Just, just at the hour when you think not. Now, if it's not real snowy, and we can, the Lord willing, next Sunday I want to speak on the subject of Christianity versus pagan worship. And if you can, bring your paper, whatever you wish, for the message. The messages will be again tonight. Brother, some of the brethren here, I suppose, will... Uh, bring it. I was going to stay, but I know the land of people stay and it's predicted snow again this afternoon to cover the roads over from Georgia and different places. So, uh, Lord willing, be next Sunday. I was going to speak the same message tonight, but I'll put it till next Sunday. And then, God be with you. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, born of a virgin, conceived God in a womb, a tabernacle in which he would dwell in. I believe that in Christ he is the incarnate God. He is God made flesh. When the Father God came into Jesus Christ, he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him dwells all the fullness. God the Father spoke the words. Jesus said, It's not me that speaketh, but my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the speaking. Therefore, Upon that basis, him being made flesh so he could die, God paying the penalty for the human race to redeem and bring up and, and come bring together the things that his own creation had lost in the fall, he redeemed it back with his own life. Then in redeeming these people that his gospel could go further, the works that I do shall you do also. More than this shall you do, for I go unto the Father. A little while and the world won't see me no more, yet you'll see me, for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. Now, we're down to the end time. Christ has returned in his form of the Holy Spirit in the fullness of his power into the church to manifest himself. It's simple. It's simple people. If there would be someone here that might be fortunate enough to have a fine education and maybe to go to a big church do not let the simplicity of this poor class of people stumble you. See, it, it's not that. The common people hurt him gladly. See, it's the common people. Now, there's these classes of people. There's some that just don't care, just lives any kind of a life, the, out in the streets and so forth. That's not the ones that hurt him. And that classical kind, they wasn't the ones that hurt him. It was a, the in-between class. The common people. The ones that's poor yet want to live clean and decent and want to live for God. That's the ones that hear him. So may you and I be that people that will hear him this day. For I truly believe that one of the greatest things that's ever broke forth in the world is breaking forth now. Amen. God bless you. Now turn the service to Brother Neville.